Okay guys, so the first book that I've decided to do an analysis on is Napoleon Hill's famous classic, The Laws of Success. So a lot of you guys probably maybe have read or have heard of Think and Grow Rich. It's uh, arguably Napoleon Hill's most uh, popular book. So this is a longer book. It's really, really good. Uh, but I decided to go with The Law of Success as it is a little bit shorter. And it goes through a lot of basics which are necessary for life. So I really like Napoleon Hill's laws. Uh, the book itself for each law maybe is like you know, 10 to 20 pages. It's a pretty quick read. Obviously for me, it took a lot longer because I was writing notes and uh, analysis. So here's a few of my notes on the topic. And uh, like I said too, if you're new to reading, that's not a problem. This is a book which I think anyone can get their hands on and you know, read it and understand it, comprehend it. So it's a great book and it will give you a lot of finesse in terms of life. Okay. Let's get started. So the first chapter is an intro chapter, and uh, it basically outlines some of the concepts in the book, a uh, quick summary, and then gives a reader what to expect in terms of, okay, when I get to this chapter, I kind of have a little bit of a prequel, and then they really dwell on the concept. Okay, so one of the laws of success is called the habit of saving. So Napoleon Hill states that nobody can succeed in life if they do not save money. This is exceedingly true, right? Because we know there's a trend, right? So the more money we make, the more income we have, uh, our proportion to spend and buy luxury goods that we don't necessarily need also rises, right? So it, if there's a guy, you know, that's making minimum wage, another guy making 120K a year, they might be at the same level after when you, you know, regard savings, because obviously the minimum wage guy, he's not, he can't afford, unless he's you no know, complete idiot, which a lot of people are, he can't afford to get a lot of luxury goods and spend his money unwisely. But the richer guy, right, he's going to have a lot of money. He's going to be approved for more loans, a higher mortgage, you know, more credit cards. And there, his finances are going to also increase proportionally with his wealth, right? So it's very true, right? Nobody can actually succeed in life if they don't save money. So uh, this is a super popular concept, which I think everyone should actually, uh, you know, try to emulate. Thumbna and I actually did an experiment where we took a guy, you know, let's say he's a bus driver and he decides he doesn't want to go to higher education from 18 to 50, 58. Even now, I think it was, we did 18 to 48, actually, it's 30 years. He's a bus driver and, you know, he doesn't have any bad habits, doesn't smoke, drink, or gamble, puts 300 bucks bi-weekly into a savings account. This guy is going to have, you know, 72,000 after 30 years. That's without any compound interest without any you know gains in his money with any uh, gains and without any gains in his savings without any investments right so you can obviously become a top boss if you're just smart with your money so that's what napoleon hill is talking about and we're going to go obviously deeper into this uh, another point napoleon hill says is enthusiasm is the backbone of a pleasing personality so i knew a guy back in the day uh, he had a lot of genetic potential, right? He was a smart guy, extremely good looking guy, extremely good looking. And uh, he was a big guy, you know, he was genetically very strong. And um, I think he was probably one of the strongest guys I knew in terms of physique, right? I mean, he could fuck anyone up on the street. Doesn't matter. He was a big guy and he's a pretty boy too, right? He had a lot of things working for him, but nobody wanted to be around this guy, okay? So he was, you know, he, you know, he dressed well, looked on the outside, looked great. But he was like a walking dead man, right? Like, I actually know someone that described him as a dead man. Like, he's an alive dead man. He doesn't say anything. Uh, guys didn't really want him to be around, right? Because he would just kind of follow the crowd without saying a word. And obviously it gets awkward, right? If there's a crew of good friends and there's just some guy trailing along. He doesn't really talk, so no one really gets to know him. No one wants to know him. They don't want him around. Uh, you know, he didn't get girls after they knew him, so... This is the importance of having enthusiasm, right? I know a couple guys who are not the smartest guys, but they have that infectious personality, right? They'll talk, they're very outgoing, very social. People love them, right? Like they've gotten many privileges in life, even though despite not being the best in school, not being the hardest working guys, uh, not being, you know, the obviously the smartest guys and not, you know, going and excelling in their job. They've had tremendous opportunities in life because enthusiasm was the foundation of their personality. So Napoleon Hill talks about the importance of that. And then self-control, right? So definition how Napoleon Hill discovers self-control is how you control your enthusiasm 
and direct it, direct it, you direct the enthusiasm where you want it to go. Okay. So let's say there's a guy that's extremely enthusiastic about working out. And I've seen many guys like this, right? They, you know, get into the gym, they get those beginner gains. They go crazy, you know, three months. Oh man, I'm the shit. I can lift. Uh, I love working out. All they do is talk about working out, but then they're having a drink. Oh, bro, it's just one drink. It's like, Shut the fuck up, bro, right? Like, it doesn't make sense that you're talking about fitness, but yet you're having a drink, right? That guy's not directing his enthusiasm. And he clearly doesn't have enough enthusiasm because he's not directing it to keep him away from that drink, you understand? So he's not obviously going to be as successful in working out as he could be if he just directed his enthusiasm to discipline and started uh, making lifestyle choices that were more congruent to his ultimate love of working out, you know, is he really that enthusiastic about it? Probably not. And another person that could direct their enthusiasm, you know, to a better quality than him. It's obviously going to make more gains and better and longer, right? So this is a huge concept we're going to talk a lot about. Temporary defeat and failure, not the same. I could probably go on for like a decade about this, right? But just to get you guys thinking of what's coming up next, right? Is that, is it really a fail? If it taught you something, just think about that moving forward. Another one of Napoleon Hill's laws is intolerance creates enemies out of people who should be friends, right? So the author, I'll give you an example that he actually wrote was really good. So he met a guy, absolute stud, really cool guy. Um, you know, it was like a really good friendship on first meet. And then he thought, you know, I, I see this guy as my best man. Like he's such a cool guy, something about him. And then he saw that he was wearing a pin on his suit that represented he was a Catholic, the author was Protestant and just boom, just left, the complete left. Then realized after that he missed out a great opportunity because of his intolerance. So that's another law we're obviously gonna explore. Uh, power is one of the most basic objects of human endeavor. Enough said about that. We're gonna talk a lot about that. Then there's two methods of gaining knowledge, okay? So there's two distinct thought classes. There's those thoughts that we produce by introspection, reflection, and thinking. And then there's those that involuntary come into our mind and, you know, their own accord. And we don't like these ones. It's like, you know, you're studying and some stupid song from, you know, the radio just comes and plays your head. It's like, oh, fuck, man, what do I do? I have ADHD. And uh, what Napoleon Hill says, and actually I can resonate with this, I'm gonna give you guys my story, is that you should entertain and actually examine these intrusive thoughts that come into your mind because they might be playing a greater purpose, right? Of why they're coming in mind. They might not actually be complete intruders. So I'll give an example. So this is year 2020, uh, you know, I was like 26 years old. And I had random thoughts of some fucking kid calling me a pussy in grade eight, okay? I'd be in the flow, studying, like, studying my ass off, right? You know, doing flashcards, just practice, practice, practice. And I would get boggled down by some fucking guy over a decade ago calling me a pussy. What the fuck, right? The night before the exam, when the tension is the highest, the spirits are going nuts, I'm stressed out, I'm still thinking about this. I write the fucking exam. I don't do as good as I could have because it's a stupid thing. So I'm pissed, right? I'm just like, you know what, man? Fuck this. What the hell is wrong? Why am I going crazy? I did some further reflection, you know, meditation, kind of thought it out. And then I would realized that the reason why that thought was playing into my mind, because I had so much regrets about the past, right? So at that point in my life, you know, for a while after, I was a skinny, fat, lazy guy, didn't work. I didn't even put in a minimum effort in anything, right? And I had so much regret because I think to this day, or, you know, back in that time stamp, I thought that if I put in the effort back then, I would have done a lot better, right? So it was just regret and it was so powerful that it actually just held me back, right? And even too, like in Islam as well, right? It says that when you make regrets and when you're thinking about the past, it's the work of the devil. So that's actually how bad having regrets and thinking about the past, how happy your past mistakes are and, going back and saying, I wish I could change it. That's actually so detrimental that, you know, even a lot of other religions too, it's like, don't think about the past, right? Like Lion King, you have that scene where a freaky, right? Simba was like, oh, what the fuck was that for, man? It's like, it's in the past, don't matter about it, right? Like, forget the past, right? So in summation, essentially, like the practice of regret is extremely, extremely deathly. And it's ingenious to one's productivity, right? So the way I got around this is I channeled that regret. You know, I channeled, uh, being called a pussy over a decade ago 
about the past, about, you know, that 10 years of my life, which I did jack all by creating a better day today, right? So I just worked harder. I said, okay, yeah, I might've been a pussy in grade. I'm not a pussy today. And I'm going to do my best to, so that label doesn't come up again, right? And I ended up putting more work and effort in. So that was actually, obviously I was pissed. I didn't do that good on a neurology exam, right? But it was a pretty valuable insight, right? Because it made me appreciate and understand why this stupid thought was coming in in the weirdest time too. So I essentially just redirected my energy and I ended up playing out for the better, right? So any of these regrets come into my mind, I'll just try to work hard and pay more attention to the task I'm doing. So if it's, if it's in the gym, it's great, right? I can obviously try to push harder, you know, like, okay, this, I'm gonna go extra hard today to make up for 10 years of being a fucktard, right? So that's the intro to the book. And then uh, we're gonna see the next chapter and we're gonna keep delving into analysis. I'm gonna take the concepts of the book, apply it to my own life, share it via stories. And hopefully this creates a uh, very applicable version of the knowledge contained in this book that you can then apply and further your own life and your self-improvement journey. Later.